I wrote down some more things. Okay. Yeah. I want to start off with something that's, um, it's kind of like about the protocols. Like, I think the protocols has a, um, have an automatically biased result. So, it doesn't favor me. Like, you know, and you can say, well, they create things of like, and no one's told me this personally, but most media and entertainment outlets, like they got a movie called A Wanted Man, you know, then it was an Amazon uh, video show that came out called A Most Wanted Man, I believe. And, um, oh, I might got them too twist around. But anyway, um, the protocols don't favor me. And I think even from where you're sitting and the approach you have to take is kind of biased too because, like, you know, it's things, like some of the things I say, like, it, can you really reply to them, you know, and, you know, you, you, well, you choose not to apply to them to where it's something where it makes sense to me. So, like, I, I kind of do a lot of the talking, and, I, and I'm fine with that, but um, it's just the protocols are a little biased, you know, and it's, it drowns me out. It undermines me and belittle me. And that's even the case with family and friends, you know. And, and of course, they can say, well, we have these protocols in place because Terrell can't handle the truth. You know, but what about before medicine? Like, I was put on, before I was put on this medicine, it was anywhere from 15 to 20 people that knew some crazy stuff was going on, you know? And the only way they knew that was because government and government representatives went to these people. So for the fact that no one told me what was going on before medicine makes it, you know, controversial that these, that these same protocols are in effect when they actually existed before the medicine. So they really can't use that with me. It's not fair to use that with me to say you can't handle the truth. That's why we're not, we have these protocols and we're not telling you what's going on. Well, you did that before medicine. So what was the excuse then? So so I'm, I'm curious about how you know that these 15 to 20 people were approached by government officials before before I was put on the medicine? Yeah, you know, or, or at whatever time. Well, I had a friend that said um, something about, you know, someone getting caught up in some stuff. Like, um, and he used another person's name, but he was referring to me. You know, the same way they're kind of communicating now, you know, the indirect stuff, like just how you just asked that question. How do I know that movies are about me? How do I know that music is about me? That's current. Like if like if a song come out tomorrow, it's gonna reference my situation. So how do I know that? You know, it's one of those like, things. Like, I, I, it's, it's crazy. I asked that that question too. So like you're making these connections and you're interpreting these things in this way. But I am. But it's actually a reality. It's not like I'm crazy, delusional, paranoid. The things I'm seeing are actually happening. You know, and before medicine, the same stuff was going on. Like, for example, I was on the phone arguing with a family member uh, when I was working in Richmond for Triple E Utilities, which is a mission utilities company that locates why you're in the ground before you dig. And I was arguing with a family were trying to get them to tell me what was going on because all this crazy stuff was going on. Well, we was out, it was me and one other guy, we was out in the community working in a in, in like a subdivision, you know, well, well, it was a neighborhood. And I was away from him on my phone doing my job, you know, complaining to a family member about all the crazy stuff that was going on with me. And what with me 
because of this situation, well, I didn't say with me, with what I was seeing around me. And I was like, yo, what is going on? Tell me what's going on. Something's not right here. And I wasn't wrong because look at me now. This was before medicine. So look at me now. So all my suspicions that I had was a reality because look at the situation I'm in now. Well, back to what I was saying, you know, um, the other employee that was working with me, he came over to where I was at and said, we have to stop work now. We got an emergency meeting back at headquarters. I get back to headquarters and the boss, his name was Steve, and everything I was saying to that family member, he communicated in front of the entire room and said pretty much everything I said, referencing everything I said, just didn't say my name. And I'm sitting there like, you know, what is going on here? You know, and it's, you know, and like, they gave me a company phone. Well, the battery went dead on the company phone. And next thing I know, I'm on the phone with somebody. And I got the phone in the back seat because it was a work phone. And I wasn't doing anything illegal. But I did smoke pot at that time. And someone called me and asked me, did I know where was pot was at? And the phone in the back seat just started beeping. It wasn't ringing. It wasn't someone calling me because it was powered off, but it started ringing. And I like, and I'm sitting like, that's weird. I've never seen that before, done before. And I was like, no, I didn't know where he was at, you know, and just a lot of weird things. And then another example, like when we was in training, um, we were supposed to get company vehicles in the laptop. I got the phone, but I didn't get the company vehicle with the laptop. And he was giving it to people underneath me that like came and starting it, came to work starting um, after me. And I'm knowing the job, I'm knowing how to do it. And it, and the crazy thing about it, he just kept picking with me. And Steve, he just, um, like he even complained about how good I was doing my job. Like we would locate wire and you know, you spray the paint mm -hmm. and mark the mm -hmm. ground. Well, mm -hmm. I was doing that all the way up to the house. He, and during a meeting, he, it was like he knew everything that was I was doing, whether work or in my personal life. So he said something about, and I kind of stay in work to a degree because you want to know what your employees are doing to make sure they're doing it correctly. But to complain about them doing it correctly and then to know what's going on in my personal life, when he complained, he was like, I know Verizon say you're supposed to go all the way to the house, but we're not doing that here. You go just further enough to where, you know, whatever it, you know, and whatever, whatever. And I'm sitting there like, seem like he's calling me out because I was marking the entire line because that's how you really supposed to do it. Mm -hmm. Like, and then I complained about, like I was saying, the workers that came in after me, how they was getting vehicles and getting a chosen and getting a destination because you worked in areas like everybody, you, you worked in like a certain area, like by me being from Lancaster, I was trying to get to Gloucester area because mm -hmm. with the company vehicle, I could just drive 45 minutes. I mm -hmm. didn't want to go to like on the back skirts of Richmond and drive what hour, two hours on Norfolk, right. where that's two to, two to three, two and a half hours. And I complained about, I complained to a family member that, you know, he still ain't giving me a company vehicle and he gave this person a company vehicle. Well, when I get to work that next morning, the same, and this was, you know, wasn't at his office where I complained. I complained to a family member. And uh, I go to work the next morning, and that person that I was complaining about getting the vehicle before me, he took the vehicle from her and brought her back in the office. You know, so everything I was thinking, everything I was saying, I was seeing. and. Steve, the guy, it was a guy named Steve, and I was trained by a guy named Randy. And then, like, for the, um, you know, and then, like, when it came to the drug test, like, I, 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 I was a habitual pot smoker. Like, I smoked a lot of fun, you know, and I flushed my system out the time, you know, before I took my, um, my, my urine. You did the urine sample. Yeah. yeah. And. I passed the urine test. I passed mm -hmm. it. 
Well, their their main hit they had a satellite branch in Richmond, but their main headquarters was in Wisconsin. And one of the guys from Wisconsin called me and asked me about my um urine test. And I'm like, yeah, I passed it, you know, but you know, and I and I leveled with him and was and told him and be, and was honest with him. I was like, yeah, I, I smoked pot, you know, in the past, but you know, I'm trying to quit. And he was like, and I was like, I pa-, but I was like, I passed the urine test. I got my results. You know. Mm-hmm. Long story short, he was like, well, basically, I'm gonna look into some things. Give me a call back at this number. And just and this kind of I'm not explaining the details of it because it was so long ago I don't really yeah, I don't really yeah. remember the ins and outs of it but this is the scenario that actually happened I found it suspicious that he called me after I'd already got my results and asked me about a urine test and I found that suspicious and he gave me a number to call him directly at the office like the um what you call it the extension he gave me his mm-hmm. extension mm-hmm. so me being a little suspicious, I called when I when it came. I think I had to go take a, I had to go take another test. So um, I was a little suspicious. Another urine test. I was a little suspicious of this dude because it just didn't make sense. So when I called back to the headquarters, I didn't tell them what he had told me and didn't ask for his extension. So when I was talking to them, they was like, "Um, you passed the drug test," and I'm like, and then that's when I said what that gentleman told me and I don't remember his name but because it was in West he was in Wisconsin mm-hmm. so I went to my boss Steve the next day and I was like what is going on you know I um, passed the drug test but I had some guy from headquarters calling me asking me about taking the drug test and you know and I thought you know like I was going to get fired so I admitted to that I smoked pot and it shouldn't have been a question that he should, he shouldn't have asked me that question if I passed the test and I did. So I told Steve, I was like, yeah, I I did smoke pot, you know, within the last 30 days. And if you really would give me a second chance, you know, I would take a second drug test. And Steve agreed to it, but you know, it was just, it was just very suspect. And like, so the doctor that actually gave me this medicine, Dr. Tingle, that's who I went to take the, the, drug the second test drug test with. And, um, yeah, so it's crazy, like, because he was, he was my childhood doctor. And then not just that, Steve actually fired me, and this is how that happened. Um, I wrecked my car coming home from my commute from Richmond from that job, and I totaled my car. And... I got a rental, but I had to take the rental back before I actually found another car. So I called Steve and I was like, I can't make it into work today because I don't have a way to get there. And I had a friend that I got a job working with me there. Mm -hmm. And a family member, he actually related to me. And uh, he was supposed to work that day too. And he was like, well, he has some important business to take care of. So he's not going to be, I'm not going to be able to call pool with him. Mm So I'm like, okay. So I called Steve, told him I couldn't make it to work because I I was having car troubles getting to work. You know, car you know car related right, issues. Right, right, I right, 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 right. And he was like, okay. So my family member that got that was working there too. He um called me later after I made plans and was like, you know, um, I actually handled everything I have to. I, I actually handled everything that I needed to handle. I'm headed to Richmond now. Did you want to come with me? And I was like, you know, I'm only like 20 years old. So, you know, young. Right. I'm like, you know, got a life. I'm like, man, I'd already made plans. And I was like, you know, I'm not going to come. I'm not going to come with you. I'd already made plans. I, You know, I talked to Steve. And I got fired from that. And this is what Steve did. He tried to instigate something with my family member that was working at Triple E with me. When... I called and he and you know he fired me and I talked to him and he was like, Well, say 
he says something around the realm of why do you think you pretty much got fired like insinuating that somebody had told him you know something and it kind of made me think about my cousin and um so I'm like okay whatever I went back to my other job you know and Steve was like um well when you give us back the company phone we're sending your last paycheck which is any what well, ranges from anywhere depending on how many hours I had right from anywhere from about six to eight hundred, possibly a thousand dollars, and this is before tax. So I gave the um, phone back to my cousin one day. He was going to, to work because he worked into it, and they never paid me. And he turned the phone in. They never paid me. So right now, current today, currently today, the Triple E Utilities owe me roughly anywhere from six hundred to eight hundred dollars. They never paid me. And these are the same people that are behind this medicine. So we started off with a rocky relationship. You know, and so, you know, look where we at today. You know, me and the government don't get along for, for how they've been treating me. You know, so they started off the gate like that. You know, and like from the stuff my, my friends were saying back home, my circle of friends was saying to me before the medicine, uh, everybody was being disrespectful. My ex-girlfriend was being disrespectful. My circle of friends was being disrespectful. Like everybody, it was just like they had inside information. They was talking bad about me. You, and, you were really feeling piled on. Yeah, you know, to the point where I wasn't like in four days, you're supposed to have 12 meals, three meals a day. So in four days, you know how many meals I had when I was supposed to have 12? Mm -hmm. I had three meal, three meals in four days. I couldn't, I couldn't, uh, I was stressed out. All I was doing was sleeping. I was sleeping all throughout the day and was awake at night. Like they really stressed me out to the max to, to like depression stressed out, like, yeah. you know, severe depression. And I was asking people what was going on, what was going on. And this was all before medicine. Wouldn't nobody tell me nothing. You know, and look where we are today. And the medicine that I take currently. Do it seem like that I was being paranoid, considering like everything that's going on now? And, and before you... I, I'll let you answer it the best you can. And then um, I, I say something. It, so. Oh, you want me? I, I say it first. You say, it, you, you, you say it first and then. This may help you like, answer it. Yeah, yeah. well. Um, you know, I know what kind of medicine I take. You know what kind of medicine I take. The whole community know what kind of medicine I take. The whole state, the whole country, the whole world. So, and this doesn't just apply to us. This apply to everybody. No need to pretend that something ain't what it is. You know, I would like it for you to say, Terrell, because of protocols, I can't answer that question. You know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I would, you know, and that's a communicate. That's that's kind of. It, it, it put things in perspective because it's an understanding. But, you know, and it's, it's beneficial for both sides because we, we are not, we're, we're being honest with each other. And, like, it's kind of like, and I, I mean it's respectfully because I, I do like coming here, you know, and um, it's just one of those things where, you know, if you can't answer, like, uh, we do a lot of, not just there's there's a, like a lot of pretending i have to pretend you know in which i do that less and less as the years been gone by but everybody do a lot of pretending and why because it ain't like we don't know what's going on you know so like for example with me like i go see my doctor when i like when i'm like let's say i'm in eastern state 
and I'm sitting here with the doctor, and you know I don't want to be in a mental hospital. So he's like, how you doing, Terrell? I'm like, I'm doing well. Is the medicine working? I'm like, yeah. Basically telling them anything they want so I can get out the hospital. Right. Right. You know, and that's that's to be expected. You know, and it's, it's not that I'm being deceitful, but they're doing the same thing. They're pretending. I'm pretending. You know, I go. I was like, when I was at Eastern State, I would go to groups. I would go to classes. You know, I would, you know, participate in everything that they was doing. You know, and I didn't have to do that. You know, but I figured if I be professional and, and conduct myself in a professional manner, Part of that is pretending. So when the doctor and the treatment team meet with me and they said, Terrell, um, so do you think the medicine's working? Has your delusions went away? Has your paranoia went away? If I want to get out of that hospital, I got to say, yeah, they have went away. What I'm supposed to say, no, they read my mind. You know, this medicine sucks. It's making me sick. You think they're going to let me out of the hospital if I say that to them? No, they're not. And that's that's a disadvantage. That's something you can add to some of the protocols, like how they are biased. They get a biased outcome, you know. And just like a couple of weeks ago at CBH, you know, I got a new doctor. And I, I, I had the foresight to fit to ask this question and when I first when I first stepped in his office, I was like, Are oh, you gonna try to have me sign something because you're my new doctor and agreeing to this medicine that I have to take it because I really don't agree with it. I don't have enough information. And he was like, No. So we had a discussion. I felt like I articulate myself well that day and I got the better of him and for him to reset, hit the reset button, he said, well, I mean, he said, you got to um, sign this paper for consent to take the medicine. Right, right. And I'm like, but you said in the beginning that I didn't have to sign any consent for it. That, that's these protocols that are binding, with, binding by my signature and they're being fully manipulated. You know, just like when I go there and pay my bill. You know, it's like, who's, when I pay these guys $40 a month, where's the money going to? Is it going to J Janssen Pharmaceuticals, who makes Risperidol? I seriously doubt it, because Janssen ain't making this medicine. I got a long uh, history of working with Janssen and calling them, giving them uh, ref serial numbers, product keys and everything that was coming on the box of these medicines. I probably got about 20 to 25 boxes that this medicine came in at my apartment in, in, uh, in the storage because I I called contact the Janssen Pharmaceuticals. I'm like, are y'all aware that people, uh, what you call it, freight, uh, trademark infringing on your product? You know, and they started an investigation, and they was like, well, you know, the, it's the, resist, resist, the investigation has concluded, and they're not, like, pretty much seeking any, any, any further action, you know, suit against anybody, or that they're not pursuing it any further. And, you know, so it's just these... These protocols, like like the first thing I said when I came here, are biased to the point where it doesn't favor me, you know. And that's whether it's y'all having y'all freedom of speech or me getting the help I need. Like I got kidney issues, liver issues. Because of the protocols, none of these things being addressed, you know. Diabetes, you know. I basically had to go out on my own and find a dietitian, to, you know, to um, to do kidney health, like preventative kidney health, uh, like eating habits and practices. Because when I asked my physician, they wouldn't do it. So I reached out on my own mm -hmm. and and did it myself, you know. And once I reached out on my own, you know, it kind of to a to a um, 
dietitian place out here, it kind of trumped my doctor. And my doctor, well, he did it on his own, so I guess, you know, we got to be his physician. We have to, you know, say, well, you know, he is diabetic. You know, approach I took when I did it on my own and then when I contacted my physician, I said I wanted prevent preventive kidney decline based off of diabetes because diabetes can give you kidney issues. Mm -hmm. And they have records of me having you know, stating that I'm diabetic, in which they go back and forth for a woman. They say you're pre-diabetes, then you're diabetic. You have pre-diabetes, then you're diabetic, then you're not diabetic at all. That changes, varies depending on whatever the case. I don't know. Probably blood sugar levels. Like, are you taking blood sugar levels right every day? Not every day, because of my diet, I manage it well. But I, I do check it, you know, a few times, I would say. I try to check at least once a week, sometimes more, um, because it's it's at a good place, you know. And so, it's it's these protocols. These protocols are actually killing me. And whether well, it's a doctor committing malpractice or me getting the help I need, you know, and it's, it's not right, you know, and a lot of people think that it's retaliatory. A lot of people think they're not helping me and using the protocols as an excuse because they don't mean well. They don't want to see me get off this medicine. They don't like how I resist them. So they said, oh, you want to fight? Well, we're going to make your life a living hell. That's what a lot of people think. I think that myself, mm. you know, and, but, you know, they got, you know, it, this country is, is weird like that, like, you know, and, you know, it's crazy how America is the most, American government is the biggest hypocrite she ever going to see. You know, and this is not an, me being anti-America. It's just the truth, you know. And like what's going on in Ukraine and Russia, didn't we do the same thing to Iraq? You know, on a larger scale for 20 plus years, you know. And, you know, but America is so powerful to where you can't call them out. You know, Russia could have called America out on their news media uh, outlets like we're doing now to them. But I, I kind of reach. think that they did. They, they may have, but I, it, it, it didn't Russia, reach. In Russia, I kind of remember, yeah. It, it didn't reach. It didn't, it didn't reach. And when I say it didn't reach, of course it's not going to reach us because we're not going to air it. Right. But, the, the same way Russia isn't airing what we're saying right now. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, but the thing is... Russia, um, the thing is, America is so powerful that they can get every other country push their narrative. Who's going to push Russian narrative besides Russia? So whereas we're, countries are leaving Russia, like McDonald's and all these countries, and like cutting Russia off and blocking Russia with sanctions and this, that, and the third, for his war and with America, and you even see like ex-soldiers going over there to fight Russia from other countries. Whereas it, when we invaded Iraq, the, these same countries that are condemning Russia sent a thousand plus troops to Iraq with us, whether it was the Brits, France, Canada, you know, they sent soldiers to fight America, to fight mm -hmm. side by side with America, and America lied about everything or why they went there. Like, even I seen a sentence here where Chuck Hagel said straight up, like, who are we kidding? This war is about oil. You got senators saying that. Right. You know, so, and it said, they said it's because Saddam changed the, was going to change buying oil from dollars to euro and a year later we invaded you know so 
America reach. And if they can topple governments like that, someone like me, I don't have a fighting chance. They've done that to me. The same way they branded Putin, they branded me the same way. You know, got everybody hating me, got everybody looking at me crazy, got everybody, you know, and if you see the person I am today, none of that existed before the medicine, you know, and it's, it's just America. And America is that powerful to where they can commit war crimes. Who's going to arrest America? Who? And then not just that, Putin's a dictatorship, so they say, or whatever the case may be. But more than likely, Putin got somebody in Russia that's pulling the strings. He just kind of like the puppet, you know, no matter how powerful he is. Exactly. You know, and that's that's just common sense. No one man has, like Kanye West said, no one man has all that power, <laughs> you know. So it's, it's probably like a group of people that Putin answered to, just like it was a group of people that Bush answered to, you know. So they're the face of the organization, but they're not the organization themselves, all by themselves, you know. So... But yeah, so you look you look at America like we we're a powerful country, you know, and Russia just ain't got that reach to where they can get who who's gonna push Russian narratives about America? Iran, North Korea, China? They they they, they some of the other, you know, they Kazakhstan, some they, of the they're, other they're remote countries. They don't and honestly in this world they don't matter. Nobody, nobody cares about what, and this is just, and this is harsh to say, but don't nobody want a tourist to North Korea, want to be a tourist in North Korea? Don't nobody want a tourist to Iran? You know, these are not hot spots where people are saying, we're going to save money for a whole year and we're going to go to Iran. You well, know, part so of that's because you can't. Maybe that, maybe, for, maybe for, so. For a long time. I, I, maybe so. But that's, that's, but still, the point I'm trying to make is, let's look at it this way. And this is how I review black and white in America. It's not that black people are bad and white people are good. But let's look at it like this. White people have built themselves up and established themselves to the point where people want to, network with them. What white people have the power. Have yes. had you know have, so have had people, and still so have look, the power. The power. So, so so look at it like this people want to network with white people. People don't want to network with black people. And to use this like analogy, if I'm if I'm a ten year old kid and I'm a black well let's not even use a skin color for this example. I'm a ten year old kid. Well my black friend I use it for my for, for that sure, for the kid sure. itself. My black friend, he eats Roman noodles for dinner. He doesn't have the latest PlayStation. He doesn't have a pool. Now my white friend, my other white friend, he has PlayStation Five. His family has an indoor pool. They got the best snacks, the best food. Who are you gonna wanna hang with? You're gonna to want to hang with the kid with the pool and the snacks. He don't, have, and we don't have to say he's black or he's white. Right, right. But the reality is, that's how people think. You know, it's kind of like, like I read this book and it's talking about it. He was this dude was comparing women. I hate to say it to dogs. Not all women, but a relationship right. he was in. Right, right, and right. And let right, me right, explain right, it right, before, right, 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 I don't want right. to be No, yeah, I, no, no, I'm, I, I'm it, not. Yeah, people, I'm sorry. people say all sorts of things. No, see, it's okay. I, maybe I didn't articulate that no, no, well. No, 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 no. But it's, this is what he it's, said. It's he was fun. like, a woman he was dating was using him, and she was kind of like his dog. You know, if he was to call his dog and say, come here, she wouldn't, you know, the dog wouldn't come to him. Mm -hmm. But when he was had food, right. pe table food, mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. dog would come. And he was saying, he, was, he wasn't saying that all women was like right. that. But he was saying a certain they're, they're, relationship they're, was like that. Yeah. Well, you and know. that there's an animal behavior yeah. component that, because human beings are animals, yeah. Yeah. that, yeah, if you're, you know. And, and like, you know, and I know I may come off harsh at times, but I didn't, I, I never mean anything personal to, oh, or derogatory to gender 
all race. It's, it's not yeah. that, you know, because, yeah. you know, like, growing up as a kid, you know, I, like, I, I've never used derogatory words to describe white people. You know, I never did any of that. Like, you know, I, I had a lot of white friends. I worked with, and you know, usually people that say these things, you know, they question, like Donald Trump, when he said, I got black friends, you know, mm -hmm. but, you know, I'm not like Donald Trump, you know, you know, when I say that, like, I grew up in a multi, like my mother used to date a white guy, like from when I was anywhere from about five to about, I say from about four to about maybe six or seven. Mm -hmm. And the guy she's married to is white Native American. Okay. So I'm not, I'm not racist. You know, it's to the point where, you know, I played baseball. You know, I had white friends like the catcher. I used to stay up at his house. My cousin, who's like my brother, he dates a, a, a white lady. You know, a lot of my friends has biracial babies by mm -hmm. white women. So, you know, if you go to my town, I would say in my town, when I was in high school, probably more white people been to my house and hung with us and was welcome in my house. And I would say, and this is not anything towards black people, but it's just the truth. Like, I would say, I'm not saying we're number one, but we in that top top five percentile of who are white people interacting and coming inside our house probably more mm -hmm. than and it, it might be number one, you know. And you know, so I, I never really looked at color like that. You know, I was never one to be like, um, I don't like this race. I don't like you know, I never been right. like that. You know, right. I always been one that that like to be cool with everybody, but when I, once I was put on this medicine, one of the first things I said, you know, I'm not going to make it about race. Now, this 2006, I said that. I'm not going to make it about race. And then BET, which is owned by Viacom, which is a Jewish family, you know, they come out on BET, like, they the face of BET, so you think it's black people, but you know Viacom and the Jews are, was behind it. But they said, um... Is it because they came out with a, like a special talking about is it because he's black? And then another special they had, what would Jesus say? You know, but I, I and that's was that's when I replied to it when they said, you know, is it because he's black? And you know, I say I'm not gonna make it about race. But as I got older and matured and hatred for how I've been treated, I make it about race now. And, and I'm not even going to lie about that because, you know, I feel like how I'm being treated, you can treat black people like this and get away with it. And most of our people is going to not like this situation, but they know not to buck the, buck the system or, or, you know, rock the boat. Whereas white people, they don't have that anymore because the white mentality is free, free, America, freedom. And you can't control a white person in this country like you can control a black person. And not just you can't, our government don't try to. They don't try to do that to their own people. They want their people to thrive. But they don't want black people to thrive. They want black people to thrive to the point of not doing better than them. You know, and and maybe that's not all people, but that's pretty much a lot of it. You know, and it's like, you know, you know, you see somebody who might do something great, you're, you're proud. You know, being a white person, but just being in America, I don't think whites will ever let a black person outshine them in any avenue you look at. You know, if if like use Tyler Perry for example, they say he had the biggest movie studio in the country. Now, I don't think white, and this is just making an example. I don't think white people in his field are going to accept that. We're being outdone by a black person, no, they're going to put all their resources and money together and make something even bigger than Tyler Perry. 
you know, so, and which they have, you know, so it's just one of those things, it's competitiveness, and it's, it's not wrong, you know, we compete every single day, we could, and as a country, we compete with other countries of highest buildings and things of that nature, but I just feel like in this country, we're not a country, we're not there yet to where society is going to accept a black person at the helm of anything. It's always going to be outdone. And it can easily happen too because you will network to the point to where it's possible and black people can't network to that point because you know we 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 all haven't made it past the fence yet you know and and honestly we're doing better than we ever been but the only reason we're doing it now or it's being known that we're having successes because i feel like white people say you know what let's give black people their flowers i feel like there's a push for that i don't feel like not that we don't deserve it, we, we've always deserved it, but I feel like there's a push to say, you know, black people doing this, black people doing that, let's, let's, black lives matter, you know, let's have a black president, let's have a black director for a movie, let's have a black as a superhero, you know, all these things are being pushed now, and, and that's what Trump supporters hate, I feel like, it wasn't just about having a black president. It's a it's a multitude of things to why you got this Trump tr Trump fanatics because just like how I'm seeing all these things and it's a it's an anomaly and it's it, it kind of not that it's an anomaly. What's the word? What's what's a better word? It's it's unnatural basically. Mm -hmm. it's, it's unnatural and. I see that things are unnatural. I, I feel like blacks are advancing at a level that's unnatural, which in return is going to lack substance and it's going to crash. Okay, so I, 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 I'm just curious, unnatural. Our what success, do you mean by that? This, our success, like, I use Obama. I feel like 2006, no, 2008 when he got elected. We won't, in a, we won't at a point in America to where we should have had a black president. And this is coming from a black person. It's not coming from a person that's against Obama, you know, because I'm happy we had a black president, you know, because it gave a lot of people hope, you know, in our community, you know, and we was united throughout that. But I felt like at the same time, my point to prove how it lacks substance, you know, because we are renting, we are renting these spaces basically. And maybe 50, 60 years from now, we could have had a black president. Do you think it was, it was too and soon? It was the too country soon. wasn't ready for we it. Could, we could have had a black president and then we could have had a president that come after him and he wouldn't have undid everything that the black president did and that's donald trump donald trump and you know obama was president gave us hope and trump came after him and undone everything that obama did as far as not policies i'm talking about as inspiration and you know done undone all that and turned it into hatred you know it's it's, it's a hatred going on it's division turned it into hatred, turned it into division. So that proves my point with a lot of stuff that's going on now. You see it with Obama and how Trump undid everything that Obama achieved for black people as a culture and, and, and a race. And because it was fast track, it lacked substance. It didn't have the structure and the foundation to survive what came there, there, there wasn't the social support you know for it. and it was just a gimmick obama presidency was a gimmick and maybe a hundred years from now it'll be substance behind it to where you know we're okay with that but 
a large majority of Trump supporters was not okay with having a black president. And it, you know, it caused division. And I think it was strategic. I feel like if I would have never been put on this medicine, it wouldn't have been no black president. I felt like it was like, oh, we got to distract, disturb, and disrupt. And then look what came after um, Obama. You saw when Obama was elected, they used that to, what's the word I'm looking for, to transform politics in general. You look at how before, Trump, before Obama, celebrities really didn't engage in politics. Matter of fact, they used to always say politics and fame don't mix because you know it can it can make it can ruin you in most cases and they use obama celebrity he was more of a celebrity than a president going you know the late night show you know he would you know do all these things he was like the, a hip president cool all the celebrities loved him from oprah who's a republican ancient i believe oprah's a republican jay-z they had all the support of the, he had all, Obama had all the support of the celebrities. Next thing you know, now they involved in politics. You got Cardi B meeting with Bernie Sanders. And I feel like it was, it was all strategic. Now, instead of taking advice from people who've been in politics all their life on choosing your candidate or who you think is best to lead. We're going to people like Cardi B, people like T.I., you know, and they're kind of endorsing these people. And for one, these people ain't gonna do nothing for our community, you know, but, and they're kind of endorsing these people and it's just something that lacks substance, you know, and without Obama, there wouldn't have been no Trump. There wouldn't have been celebrities involved in politics on TV, doing commercials, saying vote, 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 you know, which was automatically implying not to vote for Trump. It wouldn't be the Trump, the Trump fanatics because they would have been happy with the state of America. It was just one big scheme to divide us and distract us. And it all started with Obama. And this is not someone that's against Obama because, you know, when I was working in Middlesex, Obama actually flowed over the building. I don't know mm -hmm. if he was in the presidential helicopter, mm -hmm. but his presidential his, his helicopter flowed over the building. Over. I felt like, and I was on this medicine, and I felt like that was him kind of showing me some type of respect or, or whatever, you know. But, you know, um, yeah, so... You know, a lot of these things are premeditated and it's, and, you know, like some people say, you know, you, you see the good in people, you see in the bad in people, you see in both at the same time. But, you know, this situation needs to stop with me. You know, I'm not really concerned, like, I'm not really concerned about these politics or policies that really lack substance because they will all be taken away, you know, because these spaces we're just ring, you know, and, you know, you like the black excellence, you know, the spaces we're written. And then like how they are pushing, you know, transgender things, you know, it's like, it's like Democrats, just fueling some fueling Republicans to have something to fight about. I feel like it's I just want to let you know we got four minutes. Things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel like and that's and that's part of the Trump fanatics too. Like what you see with the, the gender, how they're letting girls swim, I mean dudes that transition to swim with women. Like, you know, and then you know you look at TV, you see the interracial couples, you see the the, the the gay bi couples like and I know it's to a point where actors are like man 
do I really want this role because I'm a man, I might have to kiss a man or I might have to kiss somebody of another race that I really don't want to kiss, you know, because I don't, I'm not attracted mm -hmm. to that race, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, so it's, it's a lot of stuff that's going on that, you know, and it's in a span of eight to 12 years, like all this stuff that happened in the span, I say eight to 12, 16, possibly 18 years, like so much has happened. I would say from 2000 minus, you know, I say in the last 15 to 20 years, more has happened in the world and in this country than probably 50 years before that, you know? So it's just, everything is just overwhelming and it's not, and not just with me, just to people in general. People don't know what to think. People don't know who to trust, you know. And it's it's like control chaos. And, you know. Sometimes not so controlled chaos. Yeah, yeah. And see, that's the thing. It may start off as controlled chaos, but it can always right. slip out of control. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll get oh, my you're flash getting your, your flash drive here. Yeah, it can always slip out of control. But I didn't talk about half the stuff I wanted to talk about. I got sidetracked. <laughs>